I forgot to mention Fran also. Okay, I forgot. Uh, Fran is with Brother Harry. <laughs> You'll get a chance to talk uh, at the tables and, and all that, okay? So, okay. It's certainly nice to be back here. This is only the second time in three weeks that I've spoken the other time, but killed me. <laughs> I don't know about them that heard me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to speak to you from a very, very neglected book in the scriptures, I think from a book of Ecclesiastes. And I'm going to read a verse from Ecclesiastes 4 before I get in the message that I want to give to you. Ecclesiastes 4, 14. <clears throat> you can see by this, it also has some prophecy in it. I mean prophecy by foretelling the future, not by Ordinarily in the Bible, when it speaks of prophecy and the gift of prophecy, it's talking about preaching. It's not talking about foretelling the future. But this is one where he does. For out of prison he cometh to reign. What do we mean to reign? To be the king. To be the ruler of our lives and of our heart. Set on the throne of our heart. For out of the prison he cometh to reign. Whereas also he that is born of his kingdom becometh poor. I, it seems to be in my life I found to become poor in two ways. It's become poor in spirit, realizing that he came to die for sinners. He didn't come to die for the righteous. You know why he didn't come to die for the righteous? Very simple, there weren't any. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. It'd have been funny talking to somebody that didn't exist, wouldn't he? <laughs> Whereas he that is born of his kingdom becometh poor. And it seems like the longer we're in the kingdom, the poorer we get. Otherwise, the less presumptuous we are. <coughs> I don't hear so much these days, and I think it's a good sign. We don't hear so much these days of the no-so salvation. Now, that's not to say that you can't have the assurance that you're right with God and, and right with him. But those people that talk like that talk like it doesn't matter how they live from now till they die. It does matter how you live. It does matter. That kind of teaching has produced some terrible, terrible moral wrecks on a Christian scene. I could name many, many of them at once great men with God. I had dinner one night with the man and his wife in the Royal York Hotel in Montreal or in Toronto. My brother was to see, speak that night in a big place up there and this man was to, he was gonna be the chairman of the meeting. He had been going with a wonderful Christian girl. When he got to California, he got enamored with one of those kind they have in California, and he forgot that girl back in, in Toronto, and he got married. Well, that girlfriend of his was just about the power in his life, plus his mother. Here he is now, he's running big meetings, big meetings, he's on TV. Nationwide, I heard, I heard him one time preach in Chicago, in Chicago Stadium to 18,000 people. The man today denies Christ on the nationwide TV in Canada. He's on CBC up there, Canadian broadcast. He denies the virgin birth of Christ. He denies Christ as God and he's lost. He's what the Bible would call an apostate. Now, apostate is different than a backslider. I think everybody's been a backslider because that's a matter of degree. I know I have been. But this man, to be able 
to sleep, I imagine. Because there's people have written some, have been right with God at times and then backslid from it and become apostates and then they write terrible stuff about Christianity. I could name the names of many of those. It wouldn't do you any good to know their names. But what I mean, when we talk about a no-so salvation, that people become very, very presumptuous in, in my observation. I have noticed that. But that man has gone on CBC in Canada nationwide tell him he's no longer a Christian. He doesn't believe that stuff. He's a great friend of Billy Graham. He likes Billy. He loves Billy. But he's not a Christian. Hebrews 6, 4 would tell you not to waste your breath praying for people like that. For it's impossible to renew them under repentance. It's impossible. Now, it's not impossible to get a backslider back with God. But when a backslider starts denying that Jesus is the God and this is the word of God, look out. Look out. Also, that he is born in his kingdom, becometh poor. Now, I'm going to read to you now from Ecclesiastes 9. The first verse I'm going to read is not what I'm going to speak about this morning, but this church, the church worldwide needs to know this. It's going to be a very simple phrase. I'm going to call it to your attention, but it's true. I, it's the 11th verse of Ecclesiastes 9. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to all men. I've heard it said so many times, now with God there's no accidents, and when this happens, he knew it was going to happen, and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> this says time and chance happen to all men. All. And Jesus even talked like this. If you remember the story of the Good Samaritan, he says, now he comes down this way. A priest by chance came down this way. Jesus says the priest by chance. Doesn't mean that he's foreordained to do it. But Jesus is saying there, things happen in this world by chance. And then those things that happen by chance, we cannot blame unto God what happened. Now what I want to speak to you about this morning is from the third verse. Please look at it with me. This is an evil among other, all things that are done under the sun. There is one event to all. Yea, also the hearts the heart of the son of, sons of men is full of evil. And madness is in their heart while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. I left out one verse that I was going to read to you from the fifth chapter. There is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun. Namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their own hurt. You know, I believe that when you become a Christian, and I believe it was God's all along, everything in this world he owns. But when we become a Christian, I believe that everything that we own, we should be very much aware that it belongs to God, and we are only stewards of what it is. Amen. Only to watch over it and to put it where it belongs. Just stewards. And I have seen many people, many people in the Christian scene that have kept the riches thereof to their own hurt. If God honors and blesses us financially, I think he wants to do it because, and he does it because the kingdom of God will be blessed through it. If we tend to it the way we should. 
I admit there's very few that do it. Now I want to get back to this text of this morning. When he says this is an evil, boy, you want to look very closely. I, I read two of them to you. This is an evil among all things, that under the sun there is one event unto all. Yea, also the hearts of the sons of man is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. Now I'm going to set my Bible apart aside here. I'm still going to speak from the Word of God, but I have brought and I have written down almost every word I intend to say because I've been finding people saying things that Harry Kahn believes which are not true. And I think this one will be published someday, if you'll allow me to brag a minute. <laughs> and if it is, I want to publish just the way it says right here. I'll give you an example. I was the chief engineer of a large engineering firm in New York City but also in, in Chicago. And in Chicago, when I went there, there was only one Christian in, a, in the place. Only one. And he had about the most menial job in the place. Bless his heart. They called him New Tony. Isn't that a wonderful name to have hooked on here? New Tony, because when he got saved and he come back to the, this place, he was a new man. He didn't swear, he didn't curse. He, he was a different man altogether. And new Tony, though, I think he only had fourth or fifth grade education. He ran a, a, one of the saws in the plant, and everybody had great respect for new Tony, but he'd hear things preached and then go back and preach them the next day. And they didn't come out the way the preacher said. <laughs> because... I was teaching, he heard me this particular night, don't even remember where it was in Chicago. But I said, the Bible says, holy and reverend is his name. I don't think any man, any preacher, ought to take the name reverend to his name. For the simple reason, reverend means terrible and awful, or august. And I have said to preachers, when you preach terrible and awful, I'll call you reverend. <laughs> Holy and reverend is his name. I'm not going to take the name of God on to me. I never would let anybody ordain me, and I would, might hasten to admit they weren't standing in line to do it either. <laughs> so I'm going to speak to you now from that verse. And you're going to see something a little different here than you ever have. And it's these words which I just read. The heart of the sons of men is full of evil. And madness is in their heart while they live. Now that's what the word of God says. There's some very profound things in this book of Ecclesiastes. And some of them like this. Because foolishness is bound up in the heart of the, of the young. It's continually in their heart to do evil. But the rod of correction will drive it far from them. We don't have much of the rod of correction today. In fact, as I have a friend, she was raised on the mission field in the Cameroons. I taught her in Switzerland. And her folks settled in after coming back from the mission field, and her daddy was quite old. She married a wonderful Christian man as a great computer expert for General Electric, and he still is. But I think he's over here now on loan to Princeton School of Advanced Studies. His name is Bob Stevens, and sometime you ought to have them come here, but he... And I think they have six or eight kids. I don't know. I haven't talked to them for two years, so it might be nine by now. <laughs> but her name is Marty Stevens. What a godly lady that she is. One day, they're living in Schenectady, and one of her children acted up out in the front yard, and she went out and she gave him what Patty gave the drums. 
like this, and a place that's meant for that, provided for that. She got arrested and put in jail. That's the wonderful laws of the state of New York. I once lived in New York for four years, but I escaped. <laughs> <laughs> Many people have asked me, why did I escape from New York? I said, well, there's only three reasons for living in New York. Three, that's all. First reason is you don't know any better. <laughs> you don't know how the rest of the United States lives. Second reason is you don't have enough money to get out. <laughs> Third reason is the company you work for makes you live there. That's why I was living there. <laughs> well, There, if there's anything I think is unanimous in this country, it, nobody wants to live in New York but the New Yorkers. <laughs> and I heard a lot of foolishness when I was there. Now, I'm going to start reading this to you. And by the way, the, one of the greatest sermons ever preached in, New, in this country of ours was read. His name was Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He read every word of it. Of course, in those days, they all read their sermons. But the th one of the big things that was different about his sermon, he fasted and prayed three days and three nights. Well, I haven't had much, uh, much appetite myself <laughs> the last three weeks. But it hasn't been fasting. So now I'm going to read this to you, what I have to say to you. So if anyone's... My friend Tony, I started telling you about, that I worked with in Chicago, knew Tony after hearing me preach one night and explain the word from the Hebrew reverend, which means terrible and awful, or august. He came back and said, Harry Codd was preaching last night that God is rough and tough. <laughs> well, <laughs> I said no such thing. So... This is written out. This is going to be a very serious thing you're going to listen to because we're talking about this, this verse in Ecclesiastes 9. The Bible often ascribes to unconverted man one common heart and disposition. It always makes two classes, and only two of our race. The two classes are saints and sinners. The one class converted from their sin and become God's real friends. The other remaining his unconverted enemies. Now let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's say you are a pathologist. A pathologist is one of those people when you die, he can cut you all up and find out what you died from, he thinks, most of the time. Or if a city has a a terrible plague on it or a terrible disease and a lot of people dying from it, we'll say like diphtheria or uh, typhoid fever or the plague. He will go into the city and he will study the city and he will tell you what they're dying from. And many times the first thing he looks into is the source of your drinking water. Your drinking water. Now, if he finds that some factory or some firm or some people are polluting the water and know that they're polluting it, then he and the law enforcement people are going to come down very hard on it, aren't they? Because it's killing the inhabitants of the city. Now, if you were a pathologist and you were called come to a city, let's say like Columbus, Ohio, and there are 3,000 people dying every day there by typhoid fever, and it's your job to find out what they're dying from. Well, you begin various kind of checks. You've got a little team of five or six or seven people. You've got this one doing that and this one doing this. But the one that's looking in the water, he calls you and says, look at this. 
all this pollution going in the water, and these people are drinking this water, and this is what's killing them. And now these things are very real that I'm talking about. Now, if you were the pathologist and you found people that were intentionally doing that, do you think you would think very kindly of them then and let them keep on getting away with that, do you? I should say you wouldn't. You wouldn't be doing your job if you did. Well, it's a little different with God. He lets some sinners get along many, many years. But the thing is this. He, didn't look, he doesn't look upon them as friends. Most people, even unconverted, says, God loves me. Yes, he'd love to spank them. Because that's not the kind of love he's talking about. So, there are saints and sinners. There's no in-between. According to the Bible, therefore, the heart in all unrenewed and unregenerate men is the same in its general character. As in the days of Noah, the Bible testified that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth and that every imagination of his heart was only evil continually. That's perhaps the most pathetic verse in the whole Old Testament. Here is God has made man. He's made him upright. He's made man perfect to begin with. He makes that statement. Man was great upon the earth and that every imagination of his heart was only evil continually. Observe, now God speaks of the thought of their heart as if they had one common heart, all alike in moral character, or in lack of moral character. So by Paul, God testifies that the carnal mind is at enmity with God, testifying thus, not of one man, or of a few men, but of all men, of a carnal mind. Now most people in, in Christian circles have never really understood the word carnal, carnal. Now all of you know that we're made with the intellect because we're made in God's image. Then we are made with sensibilities. We're made with the will. We're made with a conscience. We're made so we can discern relationships such as spiritual, social, business, spiritual, family relationships. Man can do those things. No animal can. You know, when a sow has 16 little piglets, you know the be first thing you better do? is get them out of there. She'll either eat them or she'll roll over on them and mash them to death. So that's a mother <laughs> and it's animals or it's offspring. Well, certainly men are not to be like that, but it seems that many, many become like that. Observe, God speaks to the thoughts of their heart as if they had one common heart, all alike in moral character or the lack of it. And along comes Paul and says, carnal mind is enmity against God. Now, in the sensibilities, all of us know we have five senses. One of them is what we can see. Now, if we're just living for what we can see in this world, we are carnal. Or of what we can hear. Let's say all I want to do all day long is sit around and listen to very fine classical music. And there are people like that. See, that's just a higher cultural level than the poor drunk in the gutter. They're both living for the senses. But one is just a higher cultural level, but to God is they're the same thing. Or if I, all I want to do is live for what I can taste. Let's say eat. It is, isn't eating two pieces of chicken that makes it sin. It's when I eat 12 pieces of chicken, it becomes sin. See, they're both the same act, but one is to gratify self, supremely selfish. 
There are a lot of people, Christian people, going on crusades, I don't mean in the gospel sense, but on cruises spending thousands of dollars every day out of this country. Yes, there's over 200,000 people dying without the gospel every day. Never heard the gospel. Is that nothing to them? Is that nothing to them? You know, dear friends, you don't have to have money to worship it. There's more poor people that worship money than there are rich people. And our evangelical churches today, as compared to India, are full of rich people. Because that is a word that's relative. Like I said to you, those born of the kingdom become poor. But they become poor intentionally for Christ's sake and the gospel's sake. There's a big difference. Haven't become poor because they blew it all on great ocean cruises where once a day people came and give them a nice little homily, nice little Bible study. Nice little Bible study. I've known people who wanted to spend the rest of their life on big ocean liners just going around the world. And yet their Bible believers didn't give a hoot about missions, but missionaries, sometimes living on such a low subsistence. I have actually prayed with missionaries on the foreign field that have lost, have lost their mind because of people right back here in the state of Pennsylvania had them on such a low subsistence. He couldn't feed his family. He couldn't do the work. He just plain lost his mind. I'd hate to be the people in Pennsylvania that had said they'd support him when he went there. I prayed with that man up in the mountains of Japan in 1958. I remember his name like his yesterday. His name was Troyer. Troyer. It's a good Mennonite name, by the way. He had lost his mind. Do you know we have had missionaries on a foreign field that died of starvation? I'll tell you the name of one right now. Alan Gardner. Alan Gardner. Don't tell me he was backslidden. No, no. Actually died. See, when I get a check, I look at that check, and I pray about it. I send it to the bank. Trust God and my wife and I We'll put that to where God wants it. I found that the older I get, the poorer I am. <laughs> I mean financially. That's okay. That's okay. I didn't come to Jesus to make me rich. And he, he has blessed me many times, but he blessed me for his kingdom's sake. That's why. And I haven't forgotten that. And I couldn't be any more pleased with my wife or with the way she has given all these years, never complained to me. Where many a man I know married, evangelical man, their wives would have given them fits. Well, I don't have this, I don't have that, and I... She has a friend. I wouldn't mention her name, I wouldn't say this back where we live. Uh, my, uh, the furniture in our house is like the clothes that the people of Israel had after God says, you're not going in the promised land. You've judged yourself unworthily. And only two that went in there, the adults, made it in the promised land. You better get that straight. Only two, Caleb and Joshua. But they were ready 40 years before they got in. But the backslidden Jews had messed it up for everybody. So God let them walk around the wilderness for 40 years with the same clothes on. It says they wax not old. Oh, I'll bet they had a chore with them women. Because, <laughs> you know, every two years they move the dresses up and then they move them down and they move them here and they move them there to get you to buy new ones. They, when they buy them all, they can't put them in their closets. They're already so full. <laughs> Boy, these people on the, that design clothes are very, very clever that way. Well, that's the way our furniture is. When we moved to Rockford, one of the, one of the three things that I was trusting God to move around to see if he wanted me to go there. 
And that's the way to tell if God wants you to go there and lay out the fleece. And you'll find if he wants to go there, he'll bring about three things that you could not in any way ever had anything to do with. The yet you know what they need to be done for you to make this trip. Because God cares. And one of them was, when we were going to go there, we got to sell our house in Chicago. We got to move out there and we got to get a house. And my wife's wondering about the furniture for a bigger house. And it wasn't so much bigger. Now, don't ever get that in your head. You, and so she said, if I sell a house for more than what you, we paid for it, can I use that for furniture? I said, yes, you can, honey. You kind of grinning to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell her. Well, Lord and Francis give me quite a fool. I left on Tuesday to lecture in Newark, New Jersey, and Boston, and I think Saginaw, Michigan. We're going to preach there on Sunday also. I get home, I said, how's everything, honey? She said, I sold the house, I bought a house in Rockford. <laughs> <laughs> I never even saw it. And she saw it, she sold it for more money, much more money than what we paid for it, and bought the furniture. Well, you know God sent someone when he, wants, when he moves like that, and she did. She sold the house. She sold it in one day. She just went and bought a $10 for sale sign and put it in the window by 10 o'clock, and it was sold by 4. <laughs> well, these real estate salesmen, man alive, some of them have got hair on them for They can sell them. <laughs> but when God's in it with a woman that wants to serve him, then when we moved there, she cried all the way there. <laughs> right, honey? <laughs> See, God can let you know that you're right in the middle of his will and he wants it done. Well, I can tell you the other two. Boy, there's something. But it doesn't belong here. So in the text, the phraseology is expressive. The heart of the sons of men is full of evil. As if the sons of men had but one heart. All in common, and this one heart, were full of evil. But all the sons of men, as if you use the word all. Now, what is intended by affirming that madness in the heart, all the men's heart while they live? This is not the madness of anger, but of insanity. True, sometimes people are mad with anger. But this is not the sense of our text. The Bible as well as customarily employs this term, madness, to explain insanity. You know, when I used to do a lot of teaching on psychology for Christian people in meetings and in where I was teaching. I still do it once in a while. None of it is Freudian. I only agreed with Freud on one thing, and I've read Freud. Freud said, man's greatest problem in, in the world is guilt, and I agree with that. You know why his biggest problem is guilt? I'll tell you why, because he's guilty. <laughs> Shouldn't have to go through college to learn that, should you? <laughs> well, anyway. I want to read this again. This is not the madness of anger, but of insanity. True, sometimes people are mad with anger. But this is not the sense of our text. The Bible, as well as customarily, employs this term madness to express insanity. This I understand to be in the sense here. Insanity is of two kinds. Now, this is what you've got to get as Christians. One, of the head. The other, of the heart. Oh, this is what's terrible, the insanity of the heart. In the first, the head or intellect is disordered. In the second, the will and voluntary powers are disordered. Intellectual insanity destroys moral agency. See, you go to a, a big 
asylum, big mental place. You, you see people going around doing strange things. I remember one of the first I went to was in Watertown, mm -hmm. Illinois. This woman looks about to be the age of my mother. And I sat there quite a while. And I watched this woman just walk around those grain, those grounds, picking up this ball and throwing about four or five feet. She'd walk up and pick it up. She'd doing that all afternoon. I'd seen prize fighters do that while they're in training on they'd keep hunched over like this. That's to get them to stop standing up like a stick. <laughs> I've seen them do that by the hour, a little bag of, of uh, rags, and they'd get them to move right. But this woman, she was about to age my mother, and I wanted to cry. I wanted to cry. She just didn't know what she was doing. There was nobody home. There was nobody home up there. I want to say this to you again. Insanity is of two kinds. One of the head, the other of the heart. And the first, the head, or intellect, is disordered. And the second, the will and voluntary powers. That's, they're in the same shape. Intellectual insanity destroys moral agency. See, when a woman or a man has lost all their mind power, you don't hold them accountable for what they do. Now, they may have been drinking too much. They may have been doing a lot of sin that drove them crazy. God holds them accountable for their antecedent choices, what they did in throwing away their moral agency. Just like a man that goes out and he does a lot of drinking of booze on a Monday or a Sunday or a Saturday night or Friday night, and he, he sits there and drinks. He knows he keeps on drinking. He, he's going to lose all his faculties f as far as controlling himself. Isn't that right? He knows that. So when he gets in the car, he can't control a car the way he should. Isn't that right? Uh, well, you, when he gets in front of the judge, well, I was drunk. That is no excuse whatsoever and isn't to God. God holds us all accountable for keeping control of our faculties and not do the things that will destroy our intellectual faculties to think and to choose and to do what's right. That's the worst thing about drinking. Oh, you can say, well, it'd be a sport. Well, nut houses are full of sports. That's right. Now, I want to say this again. Intellectual insanity destroys moral agency. The man is intellectually insane, is not for the time a moral agent. Moral responsibility is suspended before, because he cannot know his duty. But God holds him accountable for the antecedent choice of having thrown away control of his faculties. Now, we all ought to get that straight and tell people that. I've said that in courtrooms when they called me as a witness for people or when they were calling upon me to sit on a, on a jury. They've asked me questions. In fact, I was on one of these about two years ago. This was a colored woman that a dentist was trying to do a very, very difficult thing. And he was not an anesthetist, but he gave her an anesthetic that he put her so deep, she didn't come out of it for a week or two. Well, in the first place, a dentist is never supposed to give anesthetics unless he is a anesthetist. He's not supposed to do that. That's against the law. So they're questioning me. I'm to be on this because she's suing them. And she had a right to sue them. She couldn't work. She couldn't hardly do anything. Couldn't take care of her family anymore. And it's strange. You see, we always say in American law, you're innocent until proved guilty. That's not true when it's a civil suit like this. Otherwise, you've got to prove that that man or that dentist there did do wrong. So they said to me, Mr. Kahn, could you be, could you be neutral in this? I said, neutral? But it, 
<laughs> but a dentist that gave a woman an anesthetist and he's not an anesthetist himself, gave her an anesthetic? And why, well, of course I couldn't be. And listen, I said to the lawyer, if you lose this case, then you're not much of a lawyer because when it gets to a appellate court, boy, you just take them on that. They said, you're dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, did that judge change his tune because he'd been saying, no, this is a civil case and the, the dentist is not guilty until you prove him guilty. Oh, and he was coloring that, that jury something terrible. And I said to the young man beside me, and I explained this to him, boy, he got up there before I did and he was giving him the same thing, see? When I did, that judge, they picked the next thing, gave him right away, and said, you're dismissed, come home tomorrow, we'll start the case. And he got those two lawyers in the back, because that lawyer for this big insurance company had offered $250,000 to settle it that morning. He said to his judge, the judge said to him, now when you come in here tomorrow to plead this case for your insurance company, if you don't come in here with over a million dollars for that poor woman, you're out. <laughs> so I did do some good. <laughs> Because when I start talking about appellate court, and I said, well, this man, this judge here has been coloring the minds of all these people here. Oh, he's not going to let that go out. <laughs> now let's get to moral insanity. Ah, this is where most people got the real <coughs> problem. Moral insanity, on the other hand, is will madness. The madness of the will. The man retains his intellectual powers unimpaired, but he sets his heart to do evil. Just think of all the men and women setting their heart today to do evil. Well, they're starting down the road to moral insanity. First was the insanity of the mind. Now it becomes something of the will. He refused to yield to the demands of his conscience. He practically discards obligations of moral responsibility. He has the powers of free moral agency, but persistently abuses them. He has a reason or brain which will affirm obligation, but he refuses obedience to its affirmations. In this form of insanity, the reason remains unimpaired, but the heart deliberately disobeys. That's moral insanity. I want to read some of it. In this form of insanity, the reason remains unimpaired, but the heart deliberately disobeys. Insanity spoken of, and the text is moral. That of the heart. By the heart, I mean the will, the voluntary power. While a man is intellectually sane, he gets acts as if he were intellectually, he acts as if he's intellectually insane. See, the word heart has five meanings in the Bible. Five. First, it's the ability to choose, to know what to choose. To know what to choose. And this man is, knows what to choose, but what is he choosing? And the one that really finally has to do with our salvation is, I could go through the five, but the fifth one is, your manner or purpose of life. Is your manner or purpose of life to, is it to live for the glory of God and to please him and to love your fellow man and to love yourself? That's what God requires. What's this man doing? <coughs> His purpose of heart is to live supremely selfish for himself. And there's no place in heaven for a man like that. There's no place in this world for a man like that for him to live the way he is created to live. It is important to point out some of the manifestations of this state of mind. Since the Bible affirms it to be a fact that sinners are mad in the heart, we may naturally expect to see some manifestations of it. So, who are the morally insane? The answer is those who, not being intellectually insane, yet act as if they were. Now, just which you think is really the worst. To be more, to be insane up here in the mind, 
or to be acting like you're insane when you're not. That's the person at the, his, he's morally insane. That's who this is condemning. I want to give that to you again. Who are the morally insane? The answer is those who, not having been intellectually insane, yet act as if they were insane. Every man that goes out looking for something tonight he shouldn't find, going out wanting to do something he shouldn't do, he's on the road to being morally insane. The example, through those who are intellectually insane treat fiction as if it were reality and reality as if it were fiction. I said at least two or three times this week, well, now we live in a day when they call white black and black white. And there's a verse in the Bible that says you're coming to a day when they'll be calling black white and white black. But that won't change the color of the other one, will it? So I'm going to start up here and I'm going to go through this slowly again. For the example, those who are intellectually insane treat fiction as if it were reality and reality as if it were fiction. They act as if truth were not truth, as if falsehood were truth. Every man knows that insane, insane people follow the wild dreams of their own fancies, as if they were the most stern reality and can scarcely be made to feel the force of anything truly real. I have done a lot of calling in hospitals, mental hospitals, <coughs> just hospitals per se. I've heard people spin the biggest yarns of reality. Oh, I'm all right, I'll be out of here tomorrow. Well, anybody could look at them, no, they weren't. But they act as if that fairy tale is reality. No, those people were mentally ill. That's not morally ill. So men in their sins treat realities of the spiritual world as if they were not real, for foul and the most empty phantoms of this world, as if they were stern realities. They also act as if self were of supreme importance and everything else of real, uh, relati relatively of no importance. Otherwise, to gratify their selfish, sinful heart is the most important thing in the world. That's all they live for. And that's where the white becomes black. Suppose you see a man acting this out in common life. He goes around day after day assuming that he is a supreme God and practically insisting that everybody ought to have a supreme regard for his rights and comparatively little or no regard for other people's rights. Man, you can see that every day. Every day. Now if you see a man saying this and acting out, would you not account him either a blasphemer or insane? Observe now the wonderful fact. While wicked men talk so sensibly as to show they know better, yet they act as if all this were true, as if they were supposed their own self-interest to be more important than everything else in the universe and that God's interests and rights even are as nothing in comparison. Practically every sinner does this. When you got an evening service in a place, I gave this to the men of the church which I attend. Now they have a wonderful crowd on Sunday morning. Oh, that doesn't mean a thing. You gotta go there on Sunday night. Most of the time you'd have trouble choosing up sides for enough to have to play football. Wonderful car. Oh, they might miss watching the Chicago Bears get their brains beat out. <laughs> Yet they're Bear fans. Down in Dallas, same way. My wife and I, 15, 20 years ago, I was at a board meeting in Phoenix. So we, we go to church on Sunday night somewhere. If I doesn't have one, we're going to go where they do. Because I'm going to tell you something. My soul cannot get along on a 20-minute sermonette on Sunday morning. I run out of gas about Tuesday. 
So I have a spiritual appetite that wants to be fed, Brother Bill, and so does yours. And if you don't want yours to be fed over 20 minutes on Sunday morning, you better wonder whether you've got an appetite. Out where I live, most of the churches are getting rid of their Sunday night services. And they say to me, why, Brother Carl, why? I said, I'll tell you why, very plainly. If you ran a restaurant, and a man came in, you charged him $8 for a meal, and he sits down, and you gave him a hard crust of bread and an old lukewarm glass of water, and away he goes, that's all he's gotten. You wouldn't wonder three minutes of why he doesn't come back, would you? <laughs> and I tell preachers, F.B. Meyer used to say, if you spend 20, 24 hours alone with God during the week to get a message for your people, you won't have to counsel them during the week. <laughs> Any preacher with a big counseling message, I want to put a lot of real estate between me and him. Because if you preach right to your people, they don't need the counseling. But if it's going to be a Saturday night little one-hour interruption in a life of selfishness, well, you take what you get. I want to read this to you again. Suppose you see a man acting this out in common life. He goes around day after day assuming that he is a supreme God and practically insisting that everybody ought to have a, a supreme regard for his rights. Now, you don't have to be in a nut house to see this. And comparatively little or no regard for other people's rights. Now, if you see a man saying this and acting not, it out, would you not account for him either a blasphemer or insane? Observe now the wonderful fact that while wicked men talk so sensibly as to show they know better, Yet they act as if all this were true, as if they supposed their own self-interest to be more important than everything else in the universe, and that God's interests and rights even are as nothing in comparison. Practically every sinner does this. It is this essential element in all sin. Selfish men never regard the rights of anybody else unless they are in some way linked with their own. You know, they're doing it for a selfish purpose. If wicked men really believe their own rights and interests to be supreme in the universe, it would prove them intellectually insane. And we should hasten to shut them up in the nearest asylum. But when they show that they are better, yet act on this groundless assumption in the face of their better knowledge, we say with the Bible that madness is in their hearts while they live. Again, see this madness manifest, manifested in his relative estimate of time and eternity. Oh, what's this? His whole life declares that, in this view, it is more important to secure the good times than the good of eternity. The good times may be Stay home on Sunday night and see gun smoke. Or to see something like that. That's living for time. We live for eternity, don't we, Joe? <laughs> for eternity. Amen. Not just now, but for eternity. That's what the Bible teaches us to do. Madness is in their hearts. Again, we see this madness manifested in his relative estimate of time and eternity. His whole life declares that in his view, it's far more important to secure the good of time than the good of eternity. Madness is in his heart. Now, precisely this is a practice of every one of you who is living in sin. You give preference to time over eternity. You practically say, oh, give me the joys of time and stay home on Sunday night. Why should I trouble myself yet about a trivial Bible truth that really affect where I'll spend eternity? Now think of that statement. Think of that. Let me read it again. Give me the joys of time and stay home on Sunday night. Why should I trouble myself yet about this trivial Bible truth that really affect where I'll spend eternity? Boy, you can see why God says madness is in the heart. Madness. 
See, God is, is a gracious God. He doesn't say you're nuts. <laughs> he said you're mad. You're mad. We know people who are violently mad, they lose control. Thus, they regard damnation as if, as if it were salvation, and salvation as if it were damnation. <coughs> Madness is in their hearts. Now, intellectual insanity is only pitiable, not disgraceful. But moral insanity is unspeakably disgraceful. None need wonder that God shall say, listen to this, I'm quoting it now from the Bible, some shall rise to shame and everlasting contempt. Conversion to God is becoming morally sane. Get that? Conversion to God is becoming morally sane. It consists of in restoring the will and the affections to the just control of the intelligence, the reason, and the conscience so as to put the man once more in harmony with himself and all these faculties adjusted to their true positions and proper functions. There are those whose intellects are right in our day, but whose hearts are all wrong. It is the nature of the mind to be controlled by deep-seated disposition and perverted preference. And that is why the Bible is addressed to man's mind. Come, let us reason together. Now, I want to give you something here, which I have used many times, and some of you may have heard this. Now, God says to you and me to make yourself a new heart. It's not up to God, it's up to you. Make yourself a new heart. Now, you've heard me tell about being on the board of a school in Chicago with this friend of mine. Started a rescue mission on the south side, had great success, and nine out of ten of them were in there were blacks. And then they'd bring their kiddies, so they started to school. But none of these little black kiddies under ten could read or write. Well, it's not much different among the whites. <coughs> they can get out of Notre Dame now after playing four years of varsity football and can't write a letter. It's a fact. You may not think so. So he started to school. I was on the board of that school. When these little black kitties, didn't matter whether it's six or seven, eight, nine, or ten, he would draw a small circle here and a large circle here on the board. Inside this small circle, he put the letter S for self. Now, you people ought to use this. Then in this big circle over here, you say, the glory of God and love others, you love yourself. He would ask these little black kitties, which is the most intelligent to live for, yourself supremely <clears throat> or the glory of God and everybody else and your own brothers and sisters <laughs> instead of yourself? We never had a black lad under 10 years of age that didn't know the answer to that. They'd say, why, well, it's more intelligent to live for God. Mama, my brothers and sisters, and everybody else than me. All right, now, which is the most important? To live for yourself supremely? Or to live for the glory of God, to glorify God, to render him excellent by your manner and purpose of life, and to love your fellow man as you love yourself? Which is the most important, this or this one? Every time they say this one. Now, if you can reason that out, that this one was the correct one, then God hold you accountable for stop living in that one and come over here and live in this one. And that's what it calls in the Bible. Make yourself a new heart, a new purpose of life for which you live. Now you live to glorify God. That means to render him excellent by your manner and purpose of life. Not living for self. And to love your fellow man as you love yourself. Now, if you can reason this out, that's not hard. God holds you accountable to make yourself a new heart, and that's Ezekiel 18.31. Ezekiel 18.31. Now, 
I'm going to go ahead and read this. Won't be long, just this much. <laughs> so you're not going to miss watching the Eagles get beat today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that woke him up, didn't it, Gil? A selfish heart is preference, is preference of self-interest to the glory of God and the interest of his kingdom. A new heart consists in a preference of the glory of God and the interest of his kingdom instead of to one's own happiness. Boy, let me read that again. A new heart consists in a preference of the glory of God and the interest of his kingdom instead of to one's own happiness. <coughs> Friday morning, I was so sick I could hardly see straight. My wife was going to dry. And I said, God, this is the most important thing in the world you have for me to do, is not to s stay home and to feel better. Man, I'm 80 years old, how long do you want me to live? <laughs> <laughs> it isn't how long you live, it's how you live while you're living. A new heart consists in a preference of the glory of God, the excellency of God. Every time I hear somebody say something about God that's wrong, I want to stand up and teach it, <laughs> no matter where I'm at. Now, I realize I can't do that many times. A new heart consists in a preference of the glory of God, the excellency of God, and the interest of his kingdom to my own happiness. In other words, it is a change from selfishness to benevolence. From having a supreme regard to one's own interests to an absorbing and controlling choice in the happiness and glory of God and his kingdom. That's making yourself a new heart. Now you better ask yourself, dear friend, do I have a new heart in that sense, in a sense? That's a biblical sense right there. Where I learned that, there wasn't any Bible teachers in the world any better to go to, because I had been to the best ones before I went to this. I'd been to them. I spent my own money to go. Nobody paid it but me. So nobody could say I played of my knowledge of preaching. So have you made yourself a new heart? Do you pray for Buddy down there? And Mexico and his wife and child every day, like you'd want people to pray if you were there. And he said, buddy, the only missionary you know? Now just ask yourself, do you really see the gospel as God sees it? God so loved the world, we so love ourselves and our own little family. That's not God's way, believe me. When my mother, who had 11 children, saw. That's what God expected. You know what she began to do? My daddy owned the only business in town that made any sense. I mean, had any good, very expensive equipment. My mama began to take in washing. She'd give that money to that church. And when she got above her ties, she supported the missionary full time. Now, my daddy didn't like that. I own this company, my wife's taking in washing. Well, if you want to give her stop, you give her the money. <laughs> uh, you don't want to do that. Well then, don't, don't give my mom a bad time. I can tell you times when I moved it. Tweet. So when you look at that, do you, have you really got a new heart? Are you really willing to see if this work goes ahead and you're willing to give it till it hurts and then give it till you can't feel it? Well, that's the way people are who have made themselves a new heart. God will do everything he can to help you make a new heart, but he won't overpower you and make it in spite of you. It takes cooperation. Let me tell you, as I look back, since I heard the first message on missions, I was a pretty wealthy young man at that time. In a year, I was down to two bucks. <laughs> and God took care of me. He took care of me. It's many times I've been down like that. I'd be praying in the morning, praying for my missionary brothers around the world. And my mama and crippled brother. 
Say, God, how are you going to do it today? <laughs> I've done what you told me. If you can't take care of me here, how are you going to get me into heaven? <laughs> but nine o'clock, he'd, he'd take care of it. I wouldn't ask anybody anything. Now, that's when you know you're walking with God. He, he listens to you. Have you ever gone out way out on a limb for God? Most people don't believe in miracles because they never saw any, but they never lived the way to need miracles. That's the way we ought to live. So that we need them. And God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. Amen. Dear Father, in Jesus' name, may not one of us be named as having moral insanity. Insanity of the mind is bad enough. But moral insanity, dear God, may we get our priorities straight. Let's let Jesus have what he died for, which is us. And that everything that we have, blessed Jesus, bless each one that's here this morning. Bless this work and bless these dear friends from over in Hamilton, New Jersey. I love every one of them. Appreciate every one of them. Help me to be a blessing to these dear people this week. Father God, I pray to bear your mighty right arm in behalf of this work and in behalf of what they're trying to do because it takes your cooperation too, dear Lord, which you know better than I do. So help these people, dear God, to have made a new heart, which you suggest, you demand that we do because that's what's good for us. The old heart of ours is selfish continually and full of deceit and who can know it? For we pray and I thank you for this opportunity and Spirit of God make this real to them as time goes on. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.